Sheep can be helpless creatures, particularly lambs like this one. In the last session, we saw how the Good Shepherd both finds and restores the lost. We look now to complete our reflection on the rest of the parable of the shepherd and turn to its twin parable on the good woman and the lost coin. Yes. <laughs> In our last occasion of reflection, we looked at the Good Shepherd as we have it in the 15th chapter of Luke, and we stopped at the point at which the Good Shepherd goes after the sheep at great cost and finds the sheep, and then because of the nature of sheep who are frightened when lost and cannot walk, he has to pick the sheep up and carry it back to the village. And we're told that he does so rejoicing. <clears throat> a good friend of mine in Bethlehem carved a very uh, finely this beautiful small statue of the Good Shepherd. And the Good Shepherd has, as you notice, a large sheep over its shoulders. And the largeness of the sheep is an indication of the price paid. And he pays that price with joy, as you can see the smile on his face. And this is the story that we are here looking at and trying to unlock. Now, one of the things that is puzzling that we mentioned in our last session is that the 90 and 9 are left in the wilderness. But not only are they left in the wilderness, they are really left in the wilderness in the sense that think cinemagraphically. 100 sheep, one gets lost over here. The shepherd leaves the 99, goes after the one, finds it, takes it off to the village, ties it up, and skedaddles back to get the 99. No, no. He leaves the 99 in the wilderness, and he calls his friends in and has a party. Well, now, hey, Daddy-o, what, what about this little problem we've got here? What's going on in this story? We expect him to tie up the lost sheep if he's going to return directly to the village and immediately go after the 99. There is a heightened awareness of the fact that the 99 are out there by the way Jesus tells the story. He is focusing on the one. He also has the 99. Please notice theologically what he's doing. David talked about the one. Jeremiah and Ezekiel talked about the tribe, the community, all Israel that was lost, as does Zechariah. Jesus comes along and with great skill, he puts both of those concerns together in the same story. This is the first time for a thousand years that we've had this story told with any concern about the individual. But that doesn't mean that we're just forget about the community. No, Jesus is also concerned for them and he affirms them in the story and affirms that they are lost. All right, for the Pharisees that are listening, this is very difficult to get their minds around because in their idea, if you are a Jew living in England or you're living in Greece or you're living in Babylon, and you, quote, return, this means physically you leave where you are and you come back to the Holy Land of Israel. But Jesus is talking about people who've already done that. 
He's talking about the crowd who at some point in the previous hundreds of years, since they were allowed to come back under Cyrus, have made that journey, and they are now Jews living in either Galilee or in Samaria or in Judea. And he's saying, you, the 99, are still lost. Lostness now takes on a different component. The word return now takes on the meaning of the word repent, which it does have both meanings are there in Hebrew and the Greek word metanoia, which means to change the mind, is the greater emphasis on the idea of repent, but it never loses the background in the Hebrew Old Testament with the Hebrew word shub, which is return to the land and or to God. All of this is packed into the story. Let us continue. He goes after the one until he finds it. Having found it, he places it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And coming to the home, he calls in the friends. In Hebrew, this would be the chaburim. The Pharisees were a lay movement of people who got kind of fed up with the corruption of the high priesthood in Jerusalem and decided that the way forward for them was to sit around at night, lay people, still keeping their professions, and examining the law for themselves the best they could and try to follow it. And all of this is very noble. And they formed clubs in the village. The clubs was called the Friends. And the club itself was the Chabura. I never noticed this connection until I was reading an early medieval Arabic version of the Gospel of Luke. It's called Vatican Arabic 17. And it's rather bad handwriting, so it's not easy to read. But when you get to this particular verse, it says, he calls together the Chabura and the neighbors. I was quite amazed to find this Hebrew word in the middle of this Arabic text. And what did the translator spot? He obviously knew Hebrew, that the friends was a club and the club was the, what the Pharisees were all about. And so Jesus tells a story in which the friends rejoice with the shepherd. And Jesus is talking to the chabura, the friends, and they're complaining. This is a very, very gentle, but also very pointed discussion as to you people ought to be rejoicing with me rather than complaining because I've done your job and have gone after the lost, saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my sheep which was lost. The story is now over, but in the classical telling of parables in the Jewish tradition, there were two components. The first component was the story, and the second called the meshel, and the second component was the bit of extra information that you needed to understand what the story was all about. Either it's the verse that the parable interprets, or it's identification of the symbols, or it's the direction that your mind should go theologically. One of those three are added in this nimshel. Uh, we find this very clearly set forth in Isaiah 5, in which Isaiah sets out the parable uh, that he presents there of the vineyard owner and the bad grapes and the good grapes. And then at the end, he identifies the symbols. The good grapes equals X and the bad grapes equal Y. He's adding the nimshell. The nimshell for Jesus, Jesus now addresses the, to the people around him in good Jewish style. Even so, I say to you, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner. We've got a play on words here. One in Aramaic is had, and joy in Aramaic is hedwa. So Jesus starts off with the one, the had that is lost, and then he talks about the hedwa twice, the rejoicing, 
And then at the end, he says there is more hedwa over the had. And we have a very skillful user of the Aramaic language making his point with a comparison between these two words. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Well, now, what on earth does this story have to do about repentance? I mean, obviously the one is the sheep, but I mean, it looks like all that sheep does is get lost. And the shepherd has to come after it and pick it up and carry it back to the village. And Jesus' answer is, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. The sheep has to accept to be found. And repentance is now redefined very dramatically and very powerfully. For the rabbis of the period, repentance was an act which you do, which if done with sufficient quality, God will look down and as the Brits say, good show. You know, few tears please, wring your hands, show lots of remorse, tell a good story, convince everybody that you're very sincere in your turning the page and wanting to live a, a better life. And if you do a good job, then you will be rewarded on the basis of the quality of your repentance, which has to comprise three things. First of all, you have to confess your sins. Second, you have to make compensation for them. If you threw your hardball through the little old lady's window, you got to go apologize to her, and you got to tell her you'll pay for the broken window, and you got to convince her you're not going to throw any more hardballs through her front window. And if you do those three, then you can be friends with the little old lady again. So confess your sins, offer compensation for them, demonstrate your sincerity in the keeping of the law. And God will say, aha, good. I accept this. Your sins are now forgiven. And the rabbis even talked about how can we get rid of our sins? Answer, you've got a number of options. One option is you can go to Jerusalem and offer a sacrifice. That's fine. An atonement sacrifice. That'll do the job. Or if you die a very painful death, that will atone for your sins. And in Maccabees, a book written between the Old and the New Testament, there are a series of Jewish martyrs that are killed by the Greeks because they won't sacrifice to the Greek gods. And just before they're tortured to death one after another, they give a little speech and they say, may my painful death atone for my sins. Yeah, sure, if you die a painful death, for sure that'll wash away your sins. And of course, everybody expects that if Jesus is going to talk about sins just before the cross, he is going to give a similar speech. He's going to give a speech about, may my suffering atone for my sins. He doesn't. He prays for the sins of others. Big shock. And the third option is uh, the option that we me have mentioned here. You can either make a sacrifice, suffer a very painful death, or go through the work of repentance. Any one of those will do to wash away your sins. Fine. Along comes the destruction of Jerusalem. The high priest is killed. The whole system is gone. You can't go to Jerusalem to make an atonement sacrifice. The twice daily atonement sacrifice of the lamb without blemish for the whole nation isn't taking place. So what are you going to do? And the rabbinic answer was, we have our repentance. Your work of repentance will do the job. Now, I've been to what are sometimes called say-so meetings of some of my evangelical friends, and you get young people telling the story of their, of their walk in Christ, and you get whiffs of this. They are very sincerely offered. But the whiffs are, you know, I was really bad and I got into some really bad stuff and then the Lord spoke to me and, and with many tears and with all of this, I, I repented and returned to the Lord. 
and then the next guy stands up and you get kind of a, can you top this? He's got to show that he was even farther down in sin and that he, he, you know, he shed even more tears of repentance and that his work of repentance was even better quality than Joe, whom you just listened listen to. It's very first century Jewish. Because here Jesus is redefining repentance. Repentance is acceptance of being found. We've got this wonderfully in a, in, in a poem that you may be familiar with, The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. And it starts, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthian ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him an under running laughter. He's running from God and running from God and running from God. And he hears this thump, thump behind him. And there's a shadow over him. And he's scared to death. And he keeps running. And finally, he stops running away. And he discovers that the shadow over him is the shadow of the hand of God trying to find him. And the thump, thump is God who comes after him. And at the end, he says, halts by me that footfall. Is my gloom, after all, shade of his hand outstretched caressingly? This is very biblical. God comes after us in Christ, and there's a point at which we quit running away. And at that point, that acceptance of being found is Jesus' definition of repentance. And it is a radical shift from the definition that was available to the community in the rabbinic theology would that was the theology of the community itself. Jesus is breaking some very dramatic new ground as he introduces this story. We see this illustrated, for example, in the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal thinks he's going to go home and he's going to compensate for his sins. He's going to ask for job training, get a job, save his money, come back and pay, and then he can be accepted. His father comes running down the road, showers him with kisses before he hears the speech, not after. And now the question is, will the prodigal accept to be found? Is he going to say, no, no, dad, I used to be conceited. Now I'm a nice guy. Can't you see the difference? And I'll go, I'll, worse, I'll herd the sheep. I'll, I'll shovel the manure. I'll repair the terraces. You give me the toughest job in the farm, I'll do it. I'm not going to come back home until I can pay the money back. He doesn't. He accepts to be found. We know that because the father orders the banquet. He would not order the banquet. If, if, the, if the prodigal had not accepted. We have the same thing with Zacchaeus up the tree. And here comes Jesus. The crowd is mad. They're shouting at him. And Jesus says, I'm going to stay at your house tonight. And Zacchaeus comes down from the tree weeping for his sins. No. Rejoicing. The response to broken law is remorse. There's place for that. But the response for the acceptance of being found, Jesus' redefinition of repentance, is joy. The sheep is lost. He thinks it's going to die. And all of a sudden, here comes the good shepherd. And the good shepherd is going to carry me back to the village, and I'm going to live. Whoopee! Some of this profound theology is set out in a wonderful icon that I am privileged to own because it was, it was written for me. And it's an icon which is the good shepherd with the sheep. And please notice, if you notice closely, that there are nail prints in the hands of the shepherd. And as I look at this beautiful icon, I see it as a representation of the moment 
the shepherd shows up back in the village. And he looks at his friends with the sheep over his shoulders and the nail prints in his hands. And he says to them, now do you understand? So thereby, having seen this profound redefinition of the nature of repentance in this story, and we can see it, as we've mentioned, reflected elsewhere in the teachings and in the act, dramatic actions of Jesus, we need to press on and see what else is being said in this story. Over one sinner who repents, then over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This is tongue in cheek. The audience thinks they don't need to repent. Jesus knows they do because he has painted them in the story as being still in the wilderness. All we like sheep have gone astray. In the Old Testament, we read in, in the servant song and in Ecclesiastes, it says there is no one without sin. And so the tradition, the sacred tradition itself affirms that all of us are sinners. There was a discussion amongst the rabbis as to whether or not God loves the sinner who repents or the perfectly righteous who <clears throat> managed to keep the law in a precise fashion. A very silly discussion because the scripture itself says that's really not possible. All right, we're ready now to briefly summarize what we have seen in this great parable. I say great parable even though it's short because of the profound ideas that are in, in it. First of all, it talks about failed leadership. The parable contains criticism of leaders who lose their sheep and do nothing but complain about others who go after them. And second, there is a freely offered grace. The lost sheep does not earn the right to rescue. It comes as a gift. Third, as we observe, there is both incarnation and atonement. The shepherd has to come after the sheep, and having found it, it takes on the burden to get it back to the village. Fourth, we notice, notice that there are two kinds of sin. Both, both kinds are sinners who don't, can't make their way home, and one refers to the type of sin which is outside the law, and the other is sinners within the law. You can be a sinner breaking the law, and you can keep the law and still not be in a relationship with God because sin is not just a broken law. It is also deeply and profoundly a broken relationship. Number five, the theme of joy is loud and clear in the story. It comes again and again with the friends. The shepherd rejoices at the success of the saving act. Repentance, we've discussed this now with some detail that repentance is redefined and the redefinition is one of the great classic introductions of new ideas which Jesus gives to the world through his teachings. And then the individual and the community. We mentioned that also, that David is talking about the individual. The other three prophets are talking about the community. Jesus finds space in his discussion to emphasize both of them. Christology, who is the person of Christ? He is the shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is the shepherd who goes after the sheep. And all the way through the Old Testament, in all four accounts, as we mentioned, the good shepherd is God. Jesus is making the profound affirmation of his own identity. I am the one through whom God is fulfilling the great classic promise that you have had for a thousand years. Fine. Then to our amazement, we discover that there is a second parable attached to the first one. And it looks a lot like the first one. And we're amazed to find it. It's the story of the good woman. Why does Jesus add it? I think he's got a number of reasons. One is he has women disciples. This shows up a half a dozen times through the Gospels. We don't have time to go into all of that, but it's there. And another reason that he does this is that there are certainly women listening to him in the, in the audience, and he wants women to be as deeply moved with what he is saying as the men. And so he tells his stories in pairs 
One has to do with the life and experience of men, the second, the life experience of women. We have this here. We have it in the farmer who goes out and plants a mustard seed and the woman who puts the yeast into the meal. We have it also where Jesus talks about uh, you are the light of the world. And Jesus also says, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. And everybody knows that the men do the building. So the house, the, the city that is built is the work of men. The lamps that are lit are the work of women. And Jesus puts both kinds of stories into his account. But more than that, we mentioned the fact that in the 23rd Psalm, Jesus has introduced a good shepherd, obviously a male figure. And then he talks about the one who prepares a meal. Thou preparest a table before me. And the word thou is masculine. But the work that is being done is the work of a female. And in the ninth chapter of Proverbs, this is loud and clear in which hikmah, uh, the wisdom likened to a woman she mixes her wines and she does this and she does that and gets the meal all ready. Here's a lady preparing a meal for her family and friends. And here is now in the, in the 23rd Psalm, God doing the work of a woman. This drops out of the other three accounts in the Old Testament. I think Jesus spots it, God doing the work of a woman. So he decides he's going to reintroduce this, and he's going to reintroduce it in a way that will make it impossible for his listeners to forget it. They can't say, well, it's kind of a vague hint. We're not sure it's really there. No, one story about the shepherd, and that's a man, and one story about the woman. And that's the second story attached to it. Now, brace yourselves, folks. Historically, the church has always seen the Good Shepherd as a symbol for Christ, and rightly so. But historically, the church has not chosen to look at the Good Woman and say the Good Woman is also a symbol for Christ. I try to take the Bible very seriously. And I would suggest to you that if you also want to take the Bible very seriously, and I assume you do or you wouldn't be watching these lectures, that we cannot have Christology in the first story and then deny it in the second one. Either you've got Jesus, the good shepherd, and Jesus, the good woman, or you don't have any Jesus in either one of them. In fact, we have got Christology in all three figures, the Good Shepherd, the Good Woman, and the Good Father. And in the first of the lectures of this series, we noted the fact that in the Psalms, we've got all three of them, God like the Good Woman, and God like the Good Shepherd, and God like the Good Father. So this story is important, and it has its place. And it has some things to say that we don't catch in the first story. Let's try and look at them. I perceive that there are three of them. The first is the unchanged value of the coin. The sheep may be sick. It may have its coat torn. It may have a leg broken. But that quarter, once dropped into the mud and a year later found, is still worth 25 cents. Its value is created when it is minted, and none of that value is gone because of the trouble it got into. This is very important for our pastoral ministry with people. When they make bad decisions and get their lives in a mess, they think they have become worthless. How could God love me now? Look at the mess I've made of myself for, and for my family and for my friends and for my community. And this parable speaks to that. That coin, once found, is worth every bit that it, of the worth that was there before it was lost. And second, the affirmation of the worth of women. This is loud and clear. Jesus is saying, I am like this woman. I search for the lost. You should do likewise. He also likens himself later on to a mother hen, as you know. And finally, the hope of success in finding the lost. 
The sheep is out there in the big wide wilderness. You may or may not find it. The hope of finding it is much stronger if you know it's in the house. And notice that Jesus has introduced two kinds of lostness. He could have told a story about the woman going to the market and losing her coin in the marketplace. He doesn't. He tells a story about the woman losing the coin in the house. And so we've got lostness far away and lostness near at home. And all of us know people who fit into those categories of lostness. And this, these two parables speak very powerfully to both of them. <laughs>